Hi, I'm Matt Carroll, and welcome to Computational Methods for Linguistic Typology. A bit of background about this class, this was originally put together as part of the Australian Linguistic Society's 2021 Masterclasses, and I'm just re-recording them so that we can upload them. Uh, this course is designed to help you start thinking about how you might integrate computational methods as a typologist, right? This class is aimed at typologists. Um, it may as well have been called Modern Methods for Linguistic Typology because it's going to deal as much with um, things like multivariate typology as it will specific computational tools. A large part of the class will focus on how we might integrate data science methodologies in order to uh, accelerate uh, some of our research, linguistic typology research, as well as increasing both the breadth and the depth, as we'll see. Uh, but before I begin, I might talk a little bit about some of my motivations for this course. So the other day I was browsing Twitter and then I saw this meme and it may, whilst it's funny, um, you know, it's also a little bit hurtful perhaps, right? Um, I didn't make, I assure you, I did not make this specifically for the class. Um, uh, but I think it cap captures a certain perception within the field about uh, some, some of the ways that typology is done. However, I think this largely comes from a misconception about uh, uh, about what, a sort of misunderstanding about how broad, in fact, the field of linguistic typology really is. Uh, uh, furthermore, it's sort of funny, uh, when I was an undergraduate ling linguist and studying linguistics for the first time, uh, historical linguistics was considered sort of the sort of, sort of old-fashioned 19th century approach to uh, studying language. Um, I don't agree with that, but that's sort of the general attitude that was there. Uh, but in recent years, they've managed to reinvent themselves as sort of on the cutting edge of linguists who have transformed their field. Uh, they haven't transformed the field, they're still asking exactly the same questions that they always were, but they've just been able to uh, increase the accuracy and the time depth and have been able to achieve so much more by integrating computational methods. Uh, and I think that's a really good model. Um, and if the stuffy old 19th century linguists can, surely linguistic type, historical linguists can, surely his linguistic uh, typologists can as well. Excuse me. Um, so before we begin, I might just uh, start with just a broad definition of linguistic typology. When I ran this course, people had a lot of different um, contributions about, you know, about language universals, comparing languages, um, um, uh, issues of ideas about uh, functionalism. But for me, and for the purposes of this course, we're going to be taking a very broad definition. That is that Linguistic typology is the study of patterns of interlanguage variation independent from shared history right, and the associated methods. So this is a really crucial element. Talk, the crucial elements here are interlanguage variation, right? So we're interested in how languages vary. Uh, this is different from intralanguage variation or language internal variation, uh, which is typically the domain of sociolinguistics, uh, but also uh, a, a whole range of other variationist uh, approaches. Um, and the two are, of course, related, right? You, uh, 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 language internal variation drives into language variation in the long term. Uh, and crucially, it's typically we think about language, language typology, about the ways languages are different and the same, independent from shared history, right? So if two languages um, uh, descend from a common ancestor or have a long history of contact, that's shared history. Any features that are the result of that are not typically interesting to a typologist, right? They're a different set of interesting questions. So that's the definition we're going to use for linguistic typology for uh, this class. Um, and before we even get talking about what we're going to do, I want to start just digging in to some of the really famous examples. So uh, um, most people watching this video, I would assume, be very familiar with WALS, right? This is the World Atlas of Linguistic Structure. It's first published in 2005 uh, as a you know a book with a CD-ROM, uh, and now there's a you know in 2008 there was an online version and it was very frequently updated. Uh, 2013, and it's still sort of, you know, one of the biggest contributions that uh, uh, linguistic typologists have uh, had on the field of linguistics. Um, but of course, it's getting uh, perhaps older now, and there are of course wonderful projects going on like uh, Gram Bank, which will uh, take this same uh, idea and expand it even further. Um, and so, uh, Walls is a very broad database. Look, we can see up here, we can uh, come up here and we can see how many languages there are. In fact, there are 2,662 languages, just an incredible amount. Uh, there's also these fantastic tools like taking samples of these. So we might uh, have a look here and we can see, okay, what about this language Marind from this 200 sample? 
Uh, well, Marind is a, a Papuan language spoken in Indonesian province of Papua in the Morocco region. Uh, and, you know, I know a bit about Marind. It, it is uh, in contact. It's a contact language for uh, a lot of the languages that I work on in that part of the world. And you can see here that Marind has been classified for 71 different characters. Right? Things like how large its con uh, consonant inventory is here, being classified as moderately small. Um, uh, other things like it has no tone uh, and its case marking has no case marking. Uh, there's four genders. So you can see here how a language is uh, coded up by some variable for some valuable. Um, and there are, I said, 2,600 2, or so uh, languages, each coded up for a number of these uh, features. There are 192 different features, but obviously not all languages have all 192 features. But it's an incredible uh, uh, sample, uh, and it allows you to view uh, how these languages are distributed over the world. Uh, but, you know, it has some weaknesses too, right? Partially is to do with how broad it is and to the age of it. Um, and I think those are really worth looking at because we can, I think we can learn a lot about this. So here's this chapter on uh, exponents of inflectional formatives. Uh, exponents is simply the relationship between morphological formatives, affixes, uh, um, and so forth, uh, and the features that they mark. And so this is a typology that looks between uh, cumulative or polyexponential formatives, that is, a uh, morphological formative that marks two meanings versus mono exponential, marking one. Uh, and so they look through, uh, here Balthazar Bickel and Joanna Nichols, uh, and they go through and they look at, say, what, you know, what are the things that we that, uh, are also marked along with case in the world's languages. And so here they have this wonderful typology. You can see there's languages that just mark case, mark case and number, mark case and referentiality, case and term, or no case. And then you can see how these are distributed over a sample of about 160 languages across the world. Really fantastic stuff. But if you think about this, let's go back to the chapter. Um, well, what does it mean to say that uh, case and number here are marked together, right? In a language like Russian, it's pretty true of Russian, right? Case and number are marked together. Uh, but what about a language which only marks, you know, some of their cases marked with number or for some values of number? Uh, well, fortunately, uh, these uh, uh, bothers of Bickle here, Bickle and Nichols here, have done a fantastic job, and they've provided a description of how they've coded up their data. Right? Really crucial stuff. Uh, and they have here uh, an algorithm that I'll let you read on your own terms, essentially, which allows them to decide to be able to take a grammar off the shelf, read about the case system, and decide whether or not it counts, where it counts as this point on this typology. And the way they decided is to say, well, if there's any differences across the cases, uh, uh, pick the grammatical cases over the semantic cases. Within the grammatical cases, pick accusative or ergative or agentive. If not, pick this. So there's a series of if not else statements, which allow them to unambiguously decide between uh, uh, examples, between any potential examples. Right? Uh, but if you think about how that works, if we go back to our map, well, this isn't really a case of, um, uh, this isn't really a typology of case and number systems, uh, how case is co, uh, co-expresses certain other features, uh, but rather how case is co, uh, is co expressed with certain other features for some particular form in this like series of conditional languages. Right. Uh, and so this is something that these guys point out in the, um, uh, in here, they say, you know, it's impossible to typolog typologize whole languages for fusion and exponents. And so they have, they have to do this, right? This is a virtue. This is not a virtue. This is in response to how walls is coded up, right? They basically take a, a linguistic, uh, they take a language and then um, uh, reduce all of its complexity down to a single variable. Uh, and so if we think about this, this is, I mean, I, you know, I don't, ever want to seem like I'm going to go through a number of examples in this uh, and it's all work I extremely admire and look up to. I could only hope to achieve something similar in my own career. And, um, but I think it's worth being critical about these things, right? Uh, in a way, Walls is broad. It's incredibly broad with a massive sample of languages, uh, but it's not especially deep, right? So here on the, on the um, screen, you can see a picture of Lake George uh, or uh, Werewa, as it's known in the... Uh, uh, the local language, and it's um, 
Uh, it's a massive body of water. It's very big, as you can see here, but it's not especially deep, right? The deepest parts are a couple of meters deep, uh, and the vast majority of it is only about a meter or so deep, and so you could walk from one side to the other. It might take you all day, but you could do it. Um, and that's just, you know, just something to sort of, uh, as a visual reminder of what I'm talking about here. And Walls is a bit like that, right? Uh, it's incredibly... We can see some wonderful aerial distributions, uh, but the data itself reduces a lot of complexity down to some single variables. On the other end of the scale, uh, typologies such as uh, this one by Grev Corbett. So this is a paper from 2015 on lexical splits. Um, uh, 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 Grev Corbett is uh, from the University of Surrey, uh, and I have worked with him quite closely in the past and is uh, um, and this is an incredible paper that I highly recommend you check out. Really excellent work, um, uh, a really great read. Um, and so by lexical splits, he's simply looking at different ways in which um, paradigms might behave differently, right? So that part of the paradigm behaves different from another part of the paradigm of some um, inflected word. So here you've got example from Georgian, uh, where you've got uh, a split according to the tense by which stem you use. So, this stem is used in the future and this stem is used in the present. Um, so it's a sort of change in expectations. So similarly, here's one from this Lunda uh, where you've got this same stem, Zat or Zata, presumably the difference is phonologically conditioned, but in the past, tense is marked with a suffix and in the future, tense is marked with a prefix, right? So it's a split in its expectations. And so in this paper, uh, Grev, with painstaking detail, goes through all of the possible ways in which we might, uh, uh, in which these types of splits might potentially vary right? uh, and breaks it down into four binary uh, criteria. And this is within a framework called canonical typology. Um, uh, and instead of just saying, is there a split present or not? It looks at all the different ways you might have a split and might not have a split, right? That is, it, it takes the variable of splits and it breaks it down into all of its component elements and it shows uh, and then he shows for each of the possible different ways it might vary, uh, he carefully produces a beautifully hand-picked, curated, well-explained example for each of these particular points, right? Uh, and one of the crucial things here, so it shows you that, uh, that uh, each of the languages can vary, but even within a language, there can be uh, multiple different systems at play, and these can be then these multiple systems can be then compared from one language to multiple systems in another language. For instance, here there are two different Russian words here which have different splits, so they fill different parts of the paradigm. Right? Really, this is a typology of paradigms, uh, and a language might have multiple paradigms. So not only do you, are you able to compare, uh, uh, you can compare two languages, but you cannot not just comparing one of their paradigms against each other, you can compare all of them, right? So you can see how this provides a really sophisticated, fine-grained, what we might call multivariate typology. Uh, however, by virtue of simply this work, you know, this, is a, takes, a, this is, takes a lot of time uh, and is um, part of the way linguists often working in smaller teams. Um, uh, uh, there is simply just enough examples to sort of illustrate the rich complexity here, right? All of these examples are attested, uh, but we don't get a good sense of what is the sort of global distribution of these patterns of these phenomena, right? Maybe it turns out that, that one of these cells here uh, in this uh, Boolean lattice uh, is particularly rare, right? Only occurs in one in 200 examples of splits or one in a thousand, right? We don't know, right? That's not something we can infer from this work, right? Not without some considerable horizontal expansion. So in a way, uh, it's a bit like uh, uh, this is the Red Lake in Croatia. Um, uh, uh, Croatia is one of Grev's favorite pl places in the world, I believe. So I chose this for him. Um, uh, and this is incredible. It's this, uh, I think it's 500 meters deep or something, right? But only just a few meters wide. So it's incredible. It might be a bit, it's narrow in terms of its breadth, uh, but you get a really, really deep analysis. Um, so it's sort of, in some ways, it's sort of the opposite of what we see in Walls. So, uh, Again, I, these are both works that I have utmost respect for. Um, but I, what I want to stress is sort of point out some of the various current states of the art in linguistic typology. Right? We've got some studies which are uh, uh, broad, incredibly broad, but which re necessarily reduce linguistic complexity down to a set of predefined notions they've pre-established, uh, and they classify languages down uh, 
uh, from a whole complex system to a single data point. Right? Uh, this has some incredible benefits. It allows it to, us to very easily observe patterns of cross-linguistic variation, uh, and it probably speeds up some of the coding processes. Um, on the other hand, we've got some incredibly deep, uh, but unfortunately narrow studies, right, that use complex multivariate analysis, which really capture uh, the variation between languages much more accurately. Uh, however, these typically, I'm not saying all of them, but uh, often um, uh, the first of these studies show just enough examples to show what's possible, right? and we can't get much of a sense of what is common, rare, or geographically restricted. Or So, uh, our goal today is to start thinking about how we might uh, use these multivariate methods, such as canonical typology, along with data science methodologies, in order to make our typologies both broad and deep, right? Uh, and not only that, but to be able to make them able to be um, um, vertically and horizontally expandable, right? So that not only can we make them broad and deep, but that I have encoded in the, into them the ability to expand them uh, in both breadth and depth. So in a way, what we're looking for is we're lo looking to turn our typologies into the Lake Baikal of linguistic projects, right? Uh, this is a lake in Siberia. I think it's the uh, deepest lake in the world, but seventh largest lake by surface area. It's massive, it's big, and it's deep. Uh, and that's where we want to go, right? Uh, um, so this just sort of summarizes what I've said, right? We want to use these methods in order to make our typologies broad and deep. We're going to see how we can use data science workflows to accelerate some of our data gathering. Uh, crucially, we want to accelerate both make our data classification, not only speed that up, but make it incredibly precise. Uh, and this is going to have a lot of really beneficial effects as well as making our uh, our research broader and deeper. It's going to increase re reproducibility and it's going to allow for iterative uh, typologizing. And we'll see a little bit about that. Uh, and we're going to, to do that, we're going to have to make use of sophisticated modern typological approaches like canonical typology. Um, uh, the one thing I want to stress here though is that this is a journey, right? I'm, my research is certainly not the Lake Baikal of linguistic typology. It's not so it doesn't even compare uh, to the works that I've presented here today. Uh, but what's crucially important here is that I'm on the train there, right? I'm on the way there. Um, uh, every step is a step that we, every step that you take in your research uh, that is headed towards the direction of Lake, Lake Baikal is a real benefit, right? Um, uh, the idea is if you just, in your next project, you just in, implement a couple of the things we said today, right? You just create a data set that you can share. Uh, if you... Uh, share your code and software. If you, um, excuse me, uh, if you automate some of your processes, right, in order to speed up some of the language gathering. Each one of these steps in itself, you just need to do one with each project, and hopefully, you know, over years we will end up increasing the quality of our work, right? Apparently, this, I mean, <laughs> seems to be a bit of a, you know, this metaphor is a bit perhaps uh, a bit of a stretch, but you know, uh, the train, apparently it goes past Canberra, Lake George in Canberra, past Croatia, on its way to Siberia. So no doubt it's going past where you work, and I encourage you to get on here with me on the train to Lake Baikal. Okay. Um, also, I just want to point out, you know, I'm bodies of water are great and all, but I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I don't want you to think that I'm some super lake body of water enthusiast or anything like that. Um, so a bit of an overview about what this course, so right now we're in module one, this is going to have a bit of an overview uh, where we talk about multivariate and canonical typology and the motivations for computational methods. Uh, in the second module, which is broken up into four different elements, we're going to talk about how data science and linguistic typology can be integrated. We're going to look at workflows, work environments, and how we identify our domain of study. Then we're going to look at data acquisition, how we gather our data, understand it, and turn it into something usable. Uh, we're going to look at data sets and, and next-generation linguistic typology, right? That is creating computational, uh, implementable, and readable data sets from our data uh, that we can use to automate our typology, typologizing. And then in the last bit, we're going to talk about how we might share our data. Uh, in the third module, we're going to talk about uh, how we can formalize the assumptions that we build into our typology so that we can write scripts that will automatically typologize our data sets into types for us, right? Uh, so that we can not only increase the accuracy and replicability of our studies,
but that with a change of assumptions, we can see how the typologies differ. So we can compare uh, various typologies for their validity. Uh, and we can discuss the terms upon which they are based. Uh, so that's the structure. Um, uh, uh, we're going to cover a bunch of different tools. Some of them we will get more or less detail about them, uh, but you'll get to see a lot of them in action, so you'll get a sense of how you might use them yourself, uh, and I'll point you to some resources about how to develop some of these. So crucially, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be using some programming. This course is going to use Python, uh, but similar, you know, the same goals can be achieved with R as well. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about Jupyter Notebooks, and with that uh, markdown, um, uh, we'll talk about GitHub and Cloud Store and Zenodo. Uh, uh, if you're not already familiar with those, and as well as looking at formalizing our assumption using logic and set theory. So a little bit about me. What am I doing here? Um, uh, like I said, I'm a research fellow at the ARC Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language, and my research touches on a number of areas. My background and training is primarily in the documentation and description, especially of Papuan languages. I've been working mostly on the Yam languages, a family of languages from southern New Guinea, uh, with a focus specifically on the Indonesian side of the border. Uh, here's me on my very first field trip working with uh, Mamalena Ndiken uh, on the left there, uh, her daughter Anche, and on the right, uh, Baba Karel Dima. Mum um, is my uh, host mum, and uh, Baba Karel, I spent a lot of, uh, uh, he spent uh, spent a lot of time together learning uh, this language here, which is called Ngolumbu, also known as Kanum. Um, so that's some of my background, but through that, right, the, as we'll see in the third module, Ngolumbu has some of the most richest, complex, exciting verbal morphology that I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, so as a result of that, I got really interested in what we might call the typology of exponents, right? Uh, uh, that is, which we might define as the various ways that morphological structure can be used to indicate non-lexical or grammatical information in the world's languages, right? All the different ways this happens. Uh, I'm interested in... Uh, how we might formalize and describe these, but I'm also interested in what the distribution of common, uncommon, and unattested means of exponents might allow to, us to infer uh, about functional motivations on linguistic structure. And the, really this final question is really the ultimate goal of a lot of my uh, research, which is how we might explain the existence of unusually complex structures, right? typically specifically of exponents, and what these explanations might tell us more broadly about the constraints on language evolution, and then then from there, the consequences of that on things like human cognition and culture. Um, uh, so that's me. Um, crucially, a few things I want to point out. I'm not a software developer. Um, I don't have much formal training uh, in programming. I have worked in computational linguistics industry. Um, um, but, you know, part of the reason I'm saying that is, you know, to get you confidence in uh, your own skills with this regard too. You know, you don't have to be a professional to do this. I'm not what you call a computational linguist in that I use uh, the tools of NLP in a daily basis with my work. That's not what I do, right? I'm a linguist who uses a computer, right? I'm a typologist. I'm a language description. I write language. I do language description, uh, and I use a computer to to amplify my work, right? Um, and that's really how I what I imagine the people who are taking this course. Uh, are, and that's who I'm targeting here. Um, and it's a really wonderful time to, to, to start thinking, to try, start trying to take this to the next level, right? Uh, um, and, you know, in uh, linguistic, it's at a time in linguistics where there is so much uh, materials available, so many people have done the groundwork, uh, but it's at a time when it's still early enough to get in that no one expects you to be a professional software developer yet. So really encourage you to just Try anything you, you think you hear today uh, in any of these videos and just give them a go for yourself. Just have a, have a go. Um, because what's crucial here is that we're all together on this train to Lake Baikal. I, I'm on the train. I'm certainly not there yet. Uh, and I know you're not going to be there yet either, but we, we should be aspiring to get there. Uh, and together we can help ourselves uh, get there as well. Okay, so just a quick summary before uh, we move on to the next module. So linguistic topology is the study of patterns of interlanguage variation independent from shared history. So we're interested in the ways this language is different from that language, uh, independent of the things, uh, not just different, the way this language and that language, what they share in common and what they have differently, uh, uh, independent of any shared history. Uh, I highly recommend uh, in the uh, 
description to this video, I'll put in a link to another video uh, by Eric Round and Jaden Macklin Cords on this, some statistical methods you can use from uh, enable to be able to uh, distinguish uh, um, a historical signal from uh, other sorts of signal in uh, language comparison. So that's really beneficial too. But that's just, you know, we're interested in how languages are the same and different. Um, and that we're going to use a combination of multivariate typology and data science uh, methods in order to make our typologies both broad and deep. Uh, and that crucially, uh, this is not a zero-sum game. Uh, it's All that's important is that we're just taking one step every day uh, in order to improve our research. So thank you very much.